If there was one American who appealed to everyone in 1952, it was General Dwight D. Eisenhower. Oh, Eisenhower was a god figure. I mean, all over the world. Although he had shown no interest in politics, Ike was pursued as a presidential candidate by both the Republicans and the Democrats. He didn't seek the office of presidency. The office sought him. I mean, he was a very reluctant candidate. Both parties would give him anything to have them in their party. Dissatisfied with the Democrats, from their handling of the Korean War to the charges of corruption within the White House, I believe in the future of the United States of America. Eisenhower decided to join the Republicans and run for office. I think Eisenhower felt that the country really did need him. And he had been reluctant, but he also was reluctant to let the country go in the wrong direction. And I think as he watched it going in the wrong direction, Eisenhower felt that he was the right man to be able to help the country. Number 34, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Republican, 1953 to 1961, 62 years old, from Kansas. Dwight Eisenhower is remembered in two distinct, if contradictory, ways. First, as the legendary mastermind of D-Day. And second, as a seemingly semi-retired president who'd rather play golf than govern. He was a much better politician than he went on, like George Washington, his hero. Washington's genius was to convince everyone, beginning with himself, that he was no politician. Uh, Eisenhower did much of the same thing. You do not get to be a five-star general of the army without having keen political instincts. Beyond Eisenhower's military celebrity was a very charismatic individual. I Like Ike was more than a campaign slogan. It was a true sentiment. There was a marvelous aura about him. You could just feel it. Uh, he was confident. He was a decent man. He wanted to do what was right for the country. While Americans liked and trusted Ike, they weren't always sure he was completely engaged in Oval Office affairs. Most people thought that Eisenhower was essentially presiding over an administration that others were making the decisions. And it became known as the Hidden Hand Presidency, that he had a public perception of being out to lunch, but behind the scenes, every decision of note, every major policy decision, really was Eisenhower's decision. And he was calling the shots. In his first significant accomplishment, Eisenhower brought about an end to the Korean War, forging an armistice that is still in effect today. Eisenhower's military career had been focused on waging war. Now it appeared that Eisenhower was determined to use his presidency to pursue peace. He began by downsizing the military. By spending less money on defense, Ike believed that America could spend more on infrastructure and quality of life. Indeed, he went from orchestrating the largest military operation in history to pushing the world's largest public works project through Congress, the Federal Highway Act. He probably created the greatest change in our culture uh, in almost the history of the nation, and that was with the Federal Highway Act. He changed the entire face of America. While Americans welcomed the change on their landscape, they were not receptive to other changes in their culture. One of the great unresolved issues after World War II was whether or not African Americans would be forced to continue to live in a segregated society. In 1954, the Supreme Court banned racial segregation in public schools with its landmark ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education. Although Eisenhower had appointed Chief Justice Earl Warren, the motivating force behind the revolutionary ruling, Eisenhower publicly distanced himself from the decision. He thought that it was disruptive, he thought it was an inappropriate role for the federal government, and he really thought that it wasn't yet time for desegregation, or that the country wasn't really ready for it, the South wasn't really ready for it. Eisenhower was paying more attention to foreign affairs. In 1954, after the French were defeated in Vietnam and the country was split in two, Ike pledged his support for the pro-Western government of South Vietnam over the communist-run North. 
Eisenhower took a series of steps that were absolutely essential to us becoming more and more involved in Vietnam. The most important was his support of the creation of the Bank of Vietnam, the sending of, of, of huge sums of money to Vietnam in terms of aid and support. Under Ike's leadership, America enjoyed peace and great prosperity during his first term. With the economy soaring, Ike easily won re-election in 1956. Traditionally, second presidential terms are much tougher than the first, and this was true for Eisenhower. First, he had health concerns. Ike had a heart attack in 1955. That, combined with his aloof reaction to growing civil rights unrest, made him seem weak. Then came Sputnik, the first satellite in space launched by the Soviets in 1957. Americans became hysterical, believing that there was a missile gap in the Russians' favor. They had beaten us into space. I think the United States changed, at least Washington did, uh, more on that night than many people realized, because we went back to work and said, OK, this is a race, and we can't let it happen. Then, in 1959, Fidel Castro seized power in Cuba, and established a revolutionary regime just 90 miles from Florida. Another sign that America was losing out to the Soviets. At the end of the Eisenhower presidency, there was a kind of malaise in the United States, a feeling that communism was uh, overwhelming us. The grandfatherly image Eisenhower had enjoyed was now something of a liability. In his final address to the nation, Eisenhower spoke to the American people with unprecedented candor. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. For a military man, a general who had been the supreme commander of the Allied forces, this was a stunning pronouncement. The hero of World War II wanted nothing more than to leave behind a presidential legacy of peace. He recognized that war has to be a last, last, last resort. I think only someone who's fought and seen the destructiveness of war can feel it in their gut the way a man like Eisenhower did. In honor of his grandson, Eisenhower changed the name of the presidential retreat in Maryland from Shangri-La to Camp David in 1953.